G'day, mono filament. It changed and revolutionised fishing because in the water a fish virtually can't see it. So if you've got your lure on the end of it or your hook with your bait, pretty hard to detect. Trying to reproduce this in the wild with flax, how good can you get? Not very good. That's the gouge. The only real successful thing I've actually ever caught fish on, I've never caught them on a traditional hook or a lure for that matter. Uh, this here looks nothing like that. So in my quest to try to get something like this, I looked for plants. I looked on the internet, I looked at Google, and I found nothing until I searched to plant myself. It's right behind me here. Never seen anywhere before, and I'm going to go into great depth about this in another video, but today it's just a quick example. If you look in here, there it goes. I'm going to pull a piece off it now. And there we have it. Look at the end of it. Take this here and twist and pull. It's very, very strong. You won't break it. Oh, you won't break it. It'll cut your fingers. It'll cut into them, as you can see. And the more you twist. Now, it's not a monofilament, but it's certainly a lot, uh, a lot thinner than, say, a piece of flax. And it's actually stronger. And there's not a lot of work to get it like that. So you can actually tie that onto your lure or your hook straight away. And you can keep on pulling it. Very, very, very... Uh, strong and to pull it we need to wrap it around something a few twists like this otherwise I'm going to cut my fingers and try and get as much out of this as we can and that would be enough to make a trace to then go onto your line we have enough there a length and in a very short time too it takes a long time to do reverse two ply cordage but by twisting this here we've got a, a line that's thin much thinner and we can double the strength of it by going like this if we wanted to make it stronger and then start to do a two ply reverse wrap this way here as well what it doesn't have is it doesn't have the stretch of monofilament that's about 20 pound I'm giving it now I can break it if I give it a, a pull like this no not really so there you have an idea of the strength. Definitely will hold a fish. So this here is a uh, two-ply reverse wrap fishing line that I made. And it's a gouge. And my sinker is a, is a stone, a piece of sandstone. Trouble is it does dissolve. Now I want to show you another trick you can use where you can make a sinker as well that you don't need to have a hole through the stone. You take the same plant or any leaf for that matter, pull it apart again. Any leaf will do, and you take a collection of these stones when you go out to sea in your boat, and then you put the stone in the leaf like this, and then you go like that, and you put that on your line, you tie through here. You can punch a hole through it, or any way you want. You allow that to drop down to the bottom. When it gets down, it takes your line right down to the bottom. It won't stay on there. Eventually, it'll fall off. It doesn't matter. You've got your bait down the bottom. It'll stay down there. It won't flow back up because it's down there and hopefully a fish will get it before it does. You want to take a collection of stones. Uh, this is actually used quite traditionally in Indonesia. So that's another wee, uh, tip you can do. I'm going to be doing a video on cordage and what is the strongest cordage. And we're going to look at a series of plants, not just flax like this. This is harakiki here. Uh, and as you can see, there's a difference in the harakiki. This is a harakiki that's not really made into mocha. That means that the green is still in it. And as we get down, this is a proper treated. Here's a uh, it's just a very uh, rough knot. I haven't spliced it in because I don't have time. But that there's also flax, but quite a different. You can see the difference between this here and that. And that's what it looks like when you take the green off it. And you do that with a mussel shell. I want to talk to you a little bit in depth about this stuff here. Argillite. This is what Māori and New Zealand use for making a lot of tools. And you can find it in the Nelson region where I live, up the Maitai Valley. And back in the day, Māori would take the boulders from the boulder bank, which are huge, and who knows how they got them up there, and they would use them to break the stuff and make tools out of. This is one that I actually found here along the cliffs, as I did this one here, which I've used in my primitive challenge. Uh, this one here comes from the, uh, from the Mai Tai. There's some stone up there. You'll find bits broken off. This is a very, very hard stone. It can make an actually a flint when you chip it and get a spark off it. So you could in theory make fire if you worked hard enough going like this. You can hear the sound of it, but 
but to be honest there's a lot of easier ways to make fire and I want to share that with you right now this is what I made on my last uh, primitive adventure and it was made completely with stone not so difficult because wood isn't that hard you can see where I walled through here and the stone that's working as creating centrifugal force on my spindle is also sandstone and if you get that wet enough eventually it will it will fall apart the harakiki is the part that's actually the most work in making this because inevitably it wears out if you were to use a boot lace it would work much much faster and it works on the premise that this here spins and you pump it up and down and it gives you the motion back and forward like that there but this part the bottom's going or I made a hole in the bottom of it like this here and that there was also made actually with just this and another tool and this uh, is a piece of mullion which is a plant you'll find growing in river flats it's great for starting fires and it goes in there like so and it saves the actual spindle wearing of the tool so this can just be replaced and you can also use this as a drill put the piece of stone up inside that hard and then you've got that there to, to uh, bore into a piece of wood like that there if you wanted to so that is a, a tool which is most likely the easiest way that you'll ever make fire. And if you're someone like me that's not very strong, and you've got to use your, your brain a bit more than uh, your muscles, this here takes all the work out of it. The stone is doing the work, the pressure down, you don't have to push hard, and as you're turning it, your own body weight is pushing the, uh, or driving the spindle by pumping this up and down. And very, very efficient to make fire. Uh, a much, much easier way than getting your stick and doing this. Which I have done, and which I can tell you is bloody difficult. Okay, one other thing I want to show, a couple other things I want to share with you. Uh, one is this here, which I used on my challenge for all number of things. It's clatty, or flax wood, or flax stalk. And basically, it floats. It's very, very light, like balsa. The outside is, is waterproof. And the inside, you can make waterproof by putting a substance on there i used in my particular or the last primitive challenge i used pitch pine or pine pitch as it's supposed to be said uh, mixed at the right temperature over a fire with charcoal what do i mix it in i mix it in a perfectly nice little bowl that nature created for us one of these and uh, the power shell and for drinking my water out of i put a bit of clay in there to block up the holes that are underneath that so that was a tool for, for water and you can cook in this so this here is something which I made my raft out of, I made my little boy out of for my fish trap so I could see what it was, but I used it for a number of other things. The beauty in this here is it's strong, not that strong as a piece of wood, but it's strong for its size, it's waterproof, so you can make a boat out of it, a float out of it, and it's such a cool and easy piece of wood to carve to make something. You can make, for instance, something to wrap your string around, which I made, I made two pieces together of that very quick to carve if you're using primitive tools so another great product that's in the wild that you could think about using if you're out there trying to do it with no tools i think in these times where we are not sure or not certain about the future it's good to develop these skills to be able to survive with absolutely nothing but the clothes you're in because you never know when you get thrown in that situation you probably never will but it would be an insurance that would be well worth having up your sleeve if you ever find yourself in that situation and I like to test myself just in case that day comes so I can pass it on to my children so when I'm gone and things get rough they know how to find food and survive with just their bare hands if they get thrown in that situation because life is uncertain. Uh, we never never thought there'd be anything like there was a pandemic two or three years ago where we were all locked down so who knows what lies in the future we, we don't know so it's a way that you can prepare yourself for the worst even though it may not ever come. It does no harm and it's also a lot of fun testing yourself. That's just some of what I'm going to be talking about in videos coming up. And there's a lot more I'd like to talk about right now, but just uh, probably enough information for you. I'll be bringing to you different types of plants that you can use for making cordage, more than just flax, and sharing some of my secrets like I have done today with that little bit of what's the closest thing that I have found to a monofilament. And... I'll also be talking about some of the plants that you can eat and some of the ones that you don't want to eat as well. Anyway, I'll bring you some more stuff on this down the track. Hope you found this video useful. Be good. If you can't be good, be careful. And I'll see you in the next video. See you later.